Okay, so welcome back everyone to the Back to the Sal study course. Um, this uh, this is a continuation of our, um, I think we're 12, 12 sessions in now. Um, it's a continuation of the first activity in our Back to the Sal study course, uh, which is us going through the uh, the Getty a manuscript. Um, the idea of the uh, of at least this portion of the study course is to go through the Getty um, play by play <clears throat> and make note of some concepts, basics, and things that we might not see um, when we're training on the south floor. We might not, not bump into because there is quite a distance between the uh, theory uh, that's in Fiore and what ends up being um, digested and uh, taught on the south floor, particularly to a uh, recruit level audience, which is what this uh, course is geared towards. Um, so it's great to look at the manuscript um, just just in and of itself, and it's also good to look at it and see um, where a lot of the stuff that we do comes from. Um, I'm running this uh, study course, so as a consequence, you're going to get my view, and it's merely one of many. And I'm like all the instructors at uh, in Emma, I'm sure nothing is the case just because we said it, but we want you to be convinced by the same evidence that we're convinced by. So um, without further ado, um, let's uh, get into today. So today, I believe we're starting the sword in two hands section, which is pretty crazy. Um, it's um, the sword in two hands section is... Um, one of the more, one of the, the main, uh, one of the sections that gets a lot of focus in Fury, and but it's also one of the sections that is, um, I don't want to say difficult to access, but it's, um, it actually is very dense. There's a lot here, and like the sword in, in uh, one hand section, there's way more that's left out than what's added in. So we're going to have a lot, a lot of fun going through this section. I'm very, very glad we're, we're here. Um, yeah, it's probably going to take us a couple uh, sessions, if not more, but we will walk through it. We'll take our time and, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see everything. Um, before we get started on the sword and two hand section, let's remember that we, over two sessions, we've already looked at the, nobody needs my help. Nobody does. Um, we've already looked at the sword in one hand section in, uh, in, in Fiori. And so does anybody have any uh, questions or about anything that we talked about in the last, last two sessions regarding the sword in one hand? So like always, if you do, please do say so, either by typing it in the chat or by uh, uh, speaking up. Um, either if you have questions about this or um, anything that we're covering today. All right, please do uh, ask your questions. More questions, the better. Um, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Okay. Um, so, all right. Um, so let's um, start off as we do usually. We start a new section. Let's start off by trying to sketch some context. Uh, sketch a border around the subject so we know where we are and we know where we're going. So um, to some degree, um, we've already sketched a lot of necessary context in the sword in one hand section. And on the, on the other hand, we're also going to get a lot of context in a sort of refreshing way that wasn't there with the sword in one hand. Um, so with the the sword in two hands section um, uh, in, in the Getty can be read as beginning at folio 22 RA with the beginning of a series of guards and then ending with folio 31 RAB, which is a, a colloquially called the Boar's Tooth Master. And everything in between can, is... is um, I would say commonly considered to be part of this this section of the book. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, this isn't the first time we've seen swords. 
right? In this book, we've seen swords in the dagger and sword section, and we also saw swords in the sword one hand section, which we just looked at. So some of the basic concepts that we've um, uh, that are involved with swords, we've already bumped into, right? We've bumped into um, the fact that swords have true and false edges, um, that every part of the sword is a weapon. Um, we've bumped into the nature of swords, which is that they they are long bladed weapons, so they're uh, they're they're they work well when they have the space to really be what they are, but they can also function uh, in a reduced space where the cuts from the blade are not necessarily uh, optimum. And one could make the argument um, that you know while swords are you know they're long and they're sharp and they seem like they they should be used at largo right one could argue that maybe that's perhaps a uh, misconception and that swords are just a tool and you know like any tool you just need to use it properly in the right moment and it doesn't really matter what the maker intended it for if you need it you know a hard object to merge someone's skull in then the great the pommel of a sword might be just the thing and you know and isn't that great so you know whether or not swords you know live in largo or strato or whatever that's an academic topic we probably won't get into it too much but we've we've encountered what the the tool the thing that the sword is we've encountered that in the previous section we've also uh, we've also encountered concepts um involving the engagement of swords we've talked briefly about um, different kinds of engagements. Um, we're going to talk more about that as we as we deal with the sword and two-hand section. We're going to go over these concepts, of course. Um, but we looked at, in the sword one-hand section, we looked at the concept of single-time deflections, um, hinting at a discussion of obliques, beats, binds, and voids, which we're going to talk about uh, in the sword and two-hand section. And um, last but not least, we... Uh, as far as big concepts go, we looked at the notion of time versus tempo. And we looked at specifically tempo as a very critical concept that we need to understand not only to help it, uh, to help ourselves order uh, a fighting with the sword, but also to understand better what's going on with these plays and uh, the concept, uh, the, the the problems that we're going to be encountering in fencing, or rather, fighting with the sword. Okay, um, so those are those are the big topics. I think um, there's some smaller topics as well. I'm sure we'll revisit them all. Uh, in the sword and one hand section, let's remember that though we started with a posta that Fiore claimed was good against thrust cuts and thrown weapons. Um, we only had one example, maybe two, if you count Folio 21 BC, but we really only had one example of a, um, what could be commonly called a peri repost action in a large wide space, which is this scholar here, 20 VB, um, in a space that we're gonna call in the, with the sword in two hands, we're gonna call that space Largo, Giacco Largo and the other space, Giacco Strato. And I haven't really defined them very much, if at all, thus far. I was going to save that for this sword in one hand section, or the sword in two hand section. So we'll talk more about that. But curiously, in the sword in one hand section, we only saw one example of a, a, a double time action, a peri repose, and the rest of them were examples, to some degree or another, of entries. And isn't that interesting? Um, Principally because we know that there's just as much law, you know, long play with the sword in one hand as there is with the sword in two, or at least we think we know that. But what we're going to see when we look at the sword in two hands is that Fiore actually takes pains to um, at least verbally differentiate play at the at the at the tips, play, uh, long play, large play, loose play, unconstrained plays, lots of different words that people use for it. 
he takes pains to at least verbally articulate that um, that there's a difference between Largo and what he calls strato. Um, we'll dip our toe into what these things mean. Um, it's n less obvious than you think what these things mean, although the natural instinct for our understanding of, of Largo and strato is enough for us to begin. We don't really need to get into any big debates about what, what these things mean in order to get off the ground to understand what the hell we're doing. But, of course, Largo and Stretto, the actual plays of the Sword and Two Hands, are <laughs> in the middle of the whole section. There's a long way to go before we get to the plays. So, um, we're going to be starting at the beginning, of course. Now, um, let's get into the guards. Let's get into the guards. So, okay. So we're gonna save we're gonna save the, some of those concepts that I talked about, obliques, beats, bides, and voids, tempo, and um, other things. We'll probably save them for discussions of uh, about the plays, because um, the plays are the closest thing we're gonna get in this uh, review to examples of actual uh, interactions on the floor, as it were, right? And you know, martial arts is a an art, an art of doing, so it'll be probably easier to talk about those things if we save them for the plays. But we're going to begin with the guards first. And like all of the major sections in Fiore, um, the sword and two-hand section begins with a significantly long and detailed discussion of posts. I said at the beginning of this uh, course that if I had to say if I had to sum up all of Fiore in one uh, sentence, that it would be that Fiore's style of fighting is a series of posta transitions. And through posta transitions, he solves all his martial problems. So in every major section thus far, not in Bastan Ocello, and um, I mean, <laughs> technic well, I was going to say technically not in the in the sword and dagger section, but that's not really true, is it? I guess there are poses that begin those sections. But Fury doesn't, in those sections, Fury doesn't go uh, take pains to talk about posters individually, okay? He does in the Abrazari section, right? He does in the dagger section. He's got a whole page about posters, right? Uh, Folio 9R. And... Um, he does in the sword and two hand section. That's the next. Uh, we're at the third, the third formal iteration of an extended post of discussion is here. So something interesting that the Bastano Cello section, the sword and dagger section, and the sword and one hand section have in common is that though they are, of course, do they though, though they do begin with a posta, there's no abstract, if you will, discussion about the posta um, before the plays start happening. The posters are kind of shown within the plays. So isn't that interesting? But not here. Not here. Um, in the, so the sword and two hand section, what we're going to see, we're going to see a discussion of um, a number of guards and then a um, and posters. And then a discussion of cuts and then some a prefacery commentary, the Largo section, the Strato section, and then finally a third uh, or a, a final master. So that's what we're that, that's what's in store for us. Okay. So um, let's let's start it. Any questions so far? No. Great. All right. So, starting with the guards. So, strictly speaking, um, Fiori's discussion of posta with the sword in two hand is split into two parts. Um, there's some interesting scholarly discussions about why it's split into two parts and what is the significance of this split. We're not going to get into that 
today, I think it's a little above our um, necessary interest. But I do want to highlight that the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven posta, the first, um, these first posta are, or it's rather guards, rather. I'm, <coughs> I'm using the two words interchangeably, but <coughs> excuse me, some people don't like that. Some people like to talk about the the, for lack of a better description, the posta with the red lettering. They like to talk about that as one separate thing entirely, and the posta without the the lettering as something different guards not posta whatever whatever and like there's some semantics involved and there's lots of interesting things to say about that but we're not going to get into it for our purposes we're going to view this uh then this next section that we're going to look at we're going to view them all as sword posta okay where posta means the same thing it's meant for us thus far in the book posta is a place to lie with your weapon that gives you options for defense, uh, good options for defense. Okay, so um, in that vein, if we if we're looking at all of these guys as um, places to lie or uh, positions we can adopt, we have one, two, three, four, five. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 different positions that Fiore explicitly calls out. So there's a lot to go through. There's a lot to go through. Um, we're going to see... Um, a lot of concepts in the posters. We're also going to see some plays and practical uh, suggestions of practical actions that can occur with these posters. Um, though it may seem theoretical, right? I don't want anybody to be like to feel like overwhelmed or to feel like there's anything super complicated here. Um, you know what you need to know what you need to know is you need to get a an idea you need to have a sense of what these different positions are good for what are they kind of good at and what do they suck at right because there's a reason why there's so many of them and it's going to tend to be the case that some posters are better at some things than others and if we walk through the reasons for those for, for that logic, it'll make much more sense. Like, um, you know, posters that are low. Um, well, oh man. All right, I I don't want I don't want to get too into it. Well, <laughs> I was just about to speculate, but I stopped myself. So, without further ado, with all that said, let's actually get into it and let's um, let's let's move on. So let's take the first the first um, set of posters here starting at folio 22 R A and B so here we go um, who is first on the list today I should drag this over to the side so it doesn't obscure people uh, Alex would you like to read the novel for us Okay, sorry, let me just zoom in here. We are two guards, and we are alike, but contrary to one another. As with all other guards in this art, alike guards are contrary to one another, with the exception of the point guards, Posta Longa, Breve, and Mezza Porta di Ferro. With point guards against point guard, the most extended guard can reach the opponent first. Anyway, what one guard can do, its opposite also can. These guards can perform a Volta Stabile and a Mezza Volta. A Volta Stabile lets you play forward or backward from one side only, without moving your feet. A mezza volta is when you pass forward or backward, so you can play on the opposite side, forward or backward. A tutta volta is when you use one foot to describe a circle around the other foot. In other words, one foot stays in place, the other circles around it. The sword also has three movements, 
Volta Stabile, Mezza Volta, and Rotuta Volta. These two guards are both called Posta di Dona. There are four more concepts in this art. Passing forward, passing backward, and a crescimento of the front foot, and pulling back the front foot. The crescimento. Whew! Holy crap. All right, well, <clears throat> what's going on here? Um, I would... Uh, uh, one of the hills that I would die on is um, that I think this this uh, post this play this bit of text this is one of the most important bits of text in the whole corpus of fury by a mile i know i don't think there's any um you know other than other than some prep uh, some of the prefatory comments and some of the broader things that he says elsewhere in the preface um i don't think that there's a, a, a section of text that's more um more critical uh that that's ended that's ended up being more critical to our practice than this one so this is this this text pulls a lot of weight in our interpretation a lot of weight um so um this is a very good one to to remember i don't have the folio notation memorized of course but it's very important to remember that this piece of text is here and it's the first piece of text that begins the sword in two hands a section okay now the first thing to note is that we know so far that fury doesn't really he, he he doesn't often spend time talking about concepts and theory right he doesn't we've seen a lot of theory through the act of the plays and he has made some mention of theory that's true but not like this this is a very this is a very explicit theoretical discussion that we might expect actually in um some more uh, con um in some later manuscripts right this is the kind of the kind of theory that he's talking about here the kind of discussion he's he's began here is more along the lines of some of the more advanced uh, i wouldn't say uh, advanced is the wrong word some of the some of some some later fencing manuscripts that that are going out of their way to attempt to bring uh, uh, the reader who doesn't understand these concepts to these concepts to try and help them understand right so th this is a very curious paragraph in that number one it shows us that fury is aware of this kind of talk right he's perfectly capable of doing this sort of thing number one number two he's also very aware clearly that there are things in martial arts like concepts right like these broad concepts here that he's talking about he's also he's also aware of those things so now that now we know that he knows right and third because thus far in the book he hasn't really bent over backwards to do this sort of thing very often with the exception of the the prefatory comments before the Arizari section it seems as if it's really important then when he decides to comment like this right this is this is gold for for the for the reconstruction effort of fiore all this kind of thing is 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 gold absolute absolute nuggets all right um in a way that you know the play where fiore is uh telling you to find a wall to hit the guy who's giving you the you know the full nelson in a way that 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 play doesn't really help us very much understand anything but this play helps us huge so very important paragraph um now what does he actually say so we are two guards and we are alike but we are contrary to one another okay all right so what are these guards here okay these guards are um ladonna Okay, posted di oh, posted di donna. Now, what's going on here? So, so Fury's gone on this theoretical digression. He's talked a whole bunch of, uh, about a whole bunch of stuff, but he hasn't really said much about the pictures, right? He said these both these uh, guards are called posted di, di donna. Okay. And he says, we are two guards and we are alike, but contrary to, a, uh, to one another. 
So what we have here, it seems, in the image, is we have an example of the same guard, Posta di Donna, refused and not refused. Okay, that's my read. We already kind of knew this, but if we needed an example or of, an, of a concrete suggestion that all guards can be both refused and not refused, here's, here's our first example. We're going to get many more. Well, here's our first example. So, okay, here are two guards. They are alike and contrary to one another. So with and this is the first time right away Fury introduces the notion of contrary guards. So let's let's take a bird's eye view of this. Okay. Certain cuts and certain defenses, certain attacks and certain defenses are more conducive to cer certain guards than others. Okay? Throwing your weapon for throwing your weapon, post the Sagittaria is great. For throwing your weapon, um, uh, left uh, 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 this position, Kota Lunga, a left tail, um, is not so great. Right? If you were if you were facing an opponent who is in post the Sagittaria, your first thought may, may be, is he going to throw a sword? If you were facing an opponent in Kota Lunga, that would not be your first thought. Because, of course, that action is not, strictly speaking, conducive uh, to Kota Lunga, right? So when all, these, all of these posts have things they're better at and have things they're worse at. So because of that, there's going to naturally be some kind of a game of post uh, opposition. Which post is to adopt against which post is when, right? And we're about to see this, see this game. But the first thing that we're told about the situation is that the same guard is contrary to itself. Okay? So, regardless of what you know or understand about the posters, if you're concerned about opposing someone's guard, what guard to choose? Adopting the same guard is sufficient. Right? At least you know if you're adopting the same guard as the opponent, that your guard can oppose his guard. The things that will naturally develop from that position from the attacker will be naturally able to be responded to by the defender. Okay? So the same guard is contrary to itself. That's great to know. It's also good to know that this is the same guard. Right, um, contrary to what the pedants among you might prefer, refused positions, at least as far, uh, by conventional read of Fiore. Right, I'm not doing anything mystical here. Can, uh, a, a refused uh, a refused guard is the same as an unrefused guard. So these are both posta di donna. They're both contrary to each other, and um, and that's great. And that's a, and that's an example of every other guard. Okay. So, <laughs> we're one sentence in, we've already learned something really important about the guards, okay, that they're contrary to another, and about our, our, our positioning. Moving on, as with all other guards in this art, oh boy, alike guards are contrary to another. Okay, great. We, we saw this before, but we're getting it confirmed right away. Okay, perfect. Alike guards are contrary to one another. With the exception, oh, here we go, of the point guards. Posta longa, posta breve, and mezza porta di ferro. With point guards, the most extended guard can reach the opponent first. Okay, so we're going to see these guards later. I don't really want to skip to them now. I, that's, we're going to get too distracted. But what Fiore is saying here is, all guards are contrary to one another, but when the guard is point forward, specifically posta longa, posta breve, and mezza porta di ferro, with those guards, there's something um, uneven about the 
uh, the level of extension in those guards. There's something uneven. Where every other guard is contrary to itself, regardless of whether you're not you're refused or not refused, the point guards, um, they're not. Uh, uh, the, there's something uneven about the point guards. Okay. Sorry, uh, maybe a dumb question, but yep. isn't like Vicor isn't Vicorno technically also a point guard if you go by that definition? He's strictly speaking, that's correct. You're correct. So why doesn't he mention it? Good yeah. Question. Great question. I don't know. Now, so, you know, we can read him saying here, with the exception of the point guards, we can read him saying that these are the only point guards. But probably a more generous reading is that he's talking about the point guards and specifically post a longa, post a breve, mezzo porto di ferro. So that's not to say that there aren't other guards with a point forward, as we will definitely see, but he wants to call out these ones in particular. Perhaps it's because a bicorno could be countered with a bicorno? Well, um, yeah, maybe, right? Maybe. We will We will see. He, you know, we are beginning with the statement that the alike guards um, are contrary to one another. Okay. And, but there's an exception to that rule that... Um, Fury suggests. Okay, so that's just something we'll have to we'll have to f leave in our minds, right? We're going to return to that um, uh, later, sooner than later. Okay, <laughs> and as if indicating a digression, Fury says, "Anyway, what one guard can do, its opposite also can do." Okay, all right. Uh, alike guards are contrary to one another. What one guard can do, its opposite can do. Okay, fine, great. So we've got some we've got some basic some some basic theory about the nature of guards and the sword in two hands. We've got that right off the t uh, off the top. Next, these guards can perform a volta stabile and a mezza volta. Wow! Now he's actually talking about footwork. That's amazing. Because as as we as we learn. Footwork is the key to all of this stuff. We say that all the time on the South floor. It couldn't be more true. And, you know, um, without saying any names, without needing to say any names ever, the best martial artists, the best fencers have the best footwork. Pure and simple, full stop. And the reverse is also true. When you see a, someone who's fencing terribly, and when you see someone who's fighting terribly, Chances are the footwork has a major, major part to it. And this is also something that's critical for our own self-analysis. It's, you know, more often true, and I, you know, I, I say this, I fenced a long time. It's more often true that when I make a critical error, the main thing that I, that, that was going on there was an error of footwork with a whole bunch of other things comp uh, uh, compiled on top of it. So. Um, so the fact that Fiore talks about, starts to talk about footwork here um, is a godsend for the reconstruction uh, effort, and, and it's also critical for us to remember. So he, what does he say? He says these guards can perform a volta stabile and a mezza volta. Okay, so there's two pieces of footwork. Then he actually defines them. A volta stabile lets you play forward or backward from one side only without moving your feet. And a mezza volta is when you pass forward or backwards, but um, it lets you play on the opposite side. So um, these two things, I think most of our um, uh, everyone on the call here is familiar with. A volta stabile is very simply a rotation on the front, uh, on the balls of your feet, without changing your footedness. So if both of these figures started off with their left foot leading, and their um, back foot following, or their right foot following, the figure that did a volta stabile now all of a sudden has his in this direction, right? Against this opponent, he has his right foot leading and his left foot following. 
And when in class we like to say the volta stabile is going to change the weight that you have of your position from 60% on the lead and 40% on the back to 60% on the back and 40% on the front. Okay? So just this shift of weight, this very subtle shift of weight, will change your position like this. Okay? And when you've done a volta stabile, it doesn't prevent you from continuing to play and, 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 and react to the line that you began on. So if these two guys began on the same line, this figure who's done a volta stabile, he's now in a very provocative position. He's turned at least half his side to his opponent, if not more. Um, but he's still very much playing against this enemy, right? But seeing as his his position is still neutral, right? This position of footwork, even though it's drawn a little exaggerated, is the still exact same position as this. It's just that with this shift of weight, the 60% is on the back foot, at least with reference to this enemy. But he's still in a neutral position towards an enemy, let's just say, over here. Okay? So the additional utility of Volta Stabiles and what they can do for you and all sorts of uh, different uh, martial positions, the additional utility is that it allows you to play 180 degrees on the side um, that's has the inside of your position and you can you can fight an opponent over here and you could also fight an opponent over here when you're refused to one opponent you're not refused against the other as long as they're only on the one the one side of your position okay um, broadly speaking the the position of the body that's inside the lead leg so between the lead leg between the inside of the lead leg and the inside of the trailing leg. That that space is generally referred to by us as the inside of your position. And everything on the outside of the lead leg, outside of the lead arm, and the out you know, and the outside of the trailing leg and the outside of the trailing arm, that's outside your position. Right? So that's to the outside. Anyway. So um so great. So we have we have this volta stabile concept. We have this piece of footwork, and a mezzo volta, which translates, I think, um, strictly to to half turn. This is what we normally refer to as our our walk, right? This is a passing step, and the reason why it's a it's um, perfectly described as a half turn is because if this figure were to pass forward, say, and now have their right foot as their lead foot, then they're going to be able to play on the other, the whole other side with a Volta Stabile. So right now, with the left foot forward, with the Volta Stabile, they're able to play 180 degrees on this side of their body. And with the other foot forward, they're able to play on the whole other side, another 180 degrees. So what the passing steps do is they they switch the inside of your position, right? In this case, with the left foot forward, the inside of your position is facing to your right. And if you have your right foot forward, it's facing a little bit to your left. You can try this uh, yourself on the floor if you're in an apartment, whatever. These are just basic concepts of inside and outside your position. When you do a passing step, you change your footedness and your position in a way that you don't do with a volta stabile, much less an increasing step, okay, which we'll cover in a bit. So the first two pieces of footwork, one piece of footwork plays on the same side, the other plays on a different side entirely, okay? Um, and yeah, so let's read that sentence again. A volta stabile lets you play forward or backwards from one side only without moving your feet. A mezza volta is when you pass forward or backwards, letting you play on the opposite side, forward or backward, respectively. Okay, everybody clear with that? Quite. Uh, can you can you explain the mezza volta again? Okay, so um, so it it's our it's our basic passing step. So whenever you're in a neutral position like this. Um, the uh, 
whenever you're in a neutral position like this, your volta stabile can only work in one direction, right? So like this figure can't volta stabile um, to the to the left side of his lead leg, right? Um, the body doesn't work like that. Um, let me let me um, bring out the snip. Yeah, no, no, I. So, are you saying that a, a mezzo volta is a passing step with the volta stabile? Or? No, no, no. It's just no, no. The the, the mezzo volta is a to, it's a totally own thing, right? Um, it's a it's a passing step where the the back foot becomes the front foot, or the front foot becomes the back foot. So it just it switches leads. Okay, and by switching leads, it changes what's what side of your body you can uh, you can play on, right? It changes what side of your body you can do a volta stabile. Sir, so how does it function about. different from a passing step then? It uh, a mezzo volta is a passing step. Same thing. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, exact same thing. It's just the to the Italian word for it. But he has a specific passing step as a separate thing that he talks about later in the paragraph. He right? does, but we haven't got there yet. <laughs> because right. you, you are you are going to ask the question, well, then what the fuck's the difference between a passing step and a mezzo volta? Why did you mention it here, Fury? What do you mean? And we will deal with that question. So definitely ask it when we get there. Okay? Uh, uh, promise me that you'll ask it. All right? Very good. Sounds good. I'm glad you're anticipating, though. I'm glad you're anticipating. Okay. So... Um, the next piece of footwork, a tuta volta, I should have kept the snip. A tuta volta is when you use one foot to describe a circle around the other foot. In other words, one foot stays in place, the other foot circles around it. Okay, so um, oh, that's not snip. Oh, I did get a snip. All right. Uh, no, no, no. So a tuta volta, this is a piece of footwork that a new recruits have problems with for about like 10 seconds and once they once they um they realize what it is it's no longer a problem so what fury is describing is um ah, where's my mouse um what fury is describing is this right, here we go a tuta volta is when the weight is put on the lead foot and the back foot describes a circle around around the player so what it what happens with the tuta volta is the player will put their weight on their lead leg on the balls of their feet bring their left foot behind themselves and their toe which is always going to point towards their target is going to rotate and point a different direction okay so in this case if um race, race, race. In this case, if um, this if this player didn't want to face this enemy, but he wanted to face one that was here, right? That was 90 degrees to him. He could perform a tuta volta, and this foot would be brought around, this back foot would be brought around this front foot, and the front foot would end with the foot facing in this direction. Does everybody? Does that make sense to everybody? I think all of you have done this in, in class. Uh, I think all of you who are here, some of you who are watching this video, you may not have actually had an M instructor explain this uh, to you. So this might sound funky, but um, it's, a, it's a thing. It's, a, it's also really important in, in fencing as it happens. The key concept here is that this foot does not move and this foot does not go forward. Okay, if this foot goes forward, the back foot goes forward, it's some version of a passing step. Okay, anytime this back foot comes forward, off to the side, whatever, but forward, it's a some version of passing step. A tuta volta is when this back foot will draw a circle around behind the player and the lead foot will remain fixed while the tuta volta is going on. Okay. And the, it's going to change the direction of where the toe is pointing. It may change it one degree. It may change it 90 degrees. It's possible to do a tuta volta about 180 degrees. 
before it gets a little silly. So a tutu volta can be very, very small. It can also be very, very big. Okay. Uh, but this is Fiori's third piece of, of footwork. Um, next, what is next in this incredibly dense paragraph? So he finishes describing a tutu volta. A tutu volta is when you use one foot to describe a circle around the other. In other words, one foot stays to place the other circles around it. Then he says something crazy. The sword also has three kinds of movements. Okay, Fiore, lay it on us. We're ready. Volta stabile, mezza volta, and tutu volta. What? Okay. Please say more. How does that make sense? That's It's not obvious, at least, you know, what that means. So please say more, Fiore. We're looking forward to it. These guards are called both Postidiana. What? He doesn't even say more? He just airdrops this in? He just carpet bombs us with this and then goes away? Psh, well, okay, fine. Right? Fine. Fiore says the sword also has three kinds of movements. Volta stabile, mezza volta, and tutta volta. What the hell do we make of this one? Well, uh, gallons and gallons and gallons of scholarly ink has been spent trying to figure out what the hell this means there's lots of strong opinions um this is one of those um i think this is one of those fiore views that's like um it's like asking programmers what their favorite font is it's got <laughs> it's a it's it's a very small point of theory but it's got outrageously strong opinions to it <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, uh, our programmers have outrageously violent opinions about their favorite font and what the worst font is. Like Comic Sans is the worst font ever. But anyway, I don't, get into, uh, I don't want to el elicit anybody's ire. Um, so what does this mean for us? How do we understand it? All we need to, to know for now is that Fiore suggests that the sword has three ways it can move that are at least analogous to the three pieces of footwork that he's described just previous a volta stabile a mezza volta and a tutta volta okay that's all we're gonna uh, we're gonna take from this sentence we're gonna move on to prevent us from being uh bogged down forever what's next these two guards are called posta di donna okay great we know. Thank you, Fiore. Lastly, there are four more concepts in this art. Passing forward, passing back, passing... Uh, oh, is that a typo? I think that's a typo. Let's use this one. Pa <laughs> passing forward, passing back, an accrescimento of the front foot, and a pulling back of the front foot. All right, so four more footwork concepts. First of all, passing forward and passing back. What does this mean? Someone had promised me they were going to bring this up, so I don't want to steal their thunder. What does that mean? <laughs> Thank you, Alex. You fulfilled your promise. <laughs> um, so the short answer is I have no idea. <laughs> this is also something of a mystery. Though there there are scholarly theories about this. What could these two things be? Is it the same things as the Mezza Volta? Or they're different things? And if they're different things, what the hell are they? Okay. We're not gonna speculate. We're gonna take the to the Italian what what is what is the Italian word for it? The Italian word for it is um jeep 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 And Corosono for Cose in Larte Zoe Passare Tornare a Crescere e di Crescere. So Passare is the Italian word that he uses, and for Mezza Volta, he's, I mean, he. He doesn't really say passare in this place, right? 
So the text is one potential place that we can get a hint. And again, I said there were scholarly theories about this. There are opinions based on evidence as to what these mean. Um, how a passare might be different from a mezzo volta, that's, that's a valid question. We're not going to spend a, a time discussing it, but that is a valid question and an interesting scholarly topic. We're going to take the lazy view. We're going to take the lazy view that there isn't anything appreciable, di appreciably different between what Fiore means by a mezzo volta and what he means by a passare. Okay? Sounds good. Um, but I hope that scandalizes you. It uh, deserves a, a deeper study in depth by you. Not you, Alex. I mean, by everybody to, to figure out what the hell that means. <laughs> okay? Um, uh, we should always be scandalized by laser scholarship, and that's what I just did. So th there you go. Um, next, the next concept in accrescimento. Uh, accres oh, sorry, a, tor a tornare. Ah, so passing forward and a passing back. Um, uh, Leone has has um, defined these concepts as passing forward with passare and tornare as passing back. That seems to be what he has done. So again, uh, just to just to um, correct, a, I said something a little uh, too quickly. It's not just the word passare; it's tornare. So passare, tornare. What are these things? We're going to read them as the same as a mezzo volta, passing forward, passing back, as we colloquially use them in the sal. But definitely interesting scholarly discussion. Okay. Lastly, accessory and decressory. What is this stuff? An accrescimento of the front foot and a pulling back of the front foot. Um, it's pretty clear actually what he means by this, um, though it also creates more questions. An accrescimento of the front foot, this is. Um, to my understanding, universally understood as an increasing step. Of the to, forwards, right? An increasing step forwards, right? And and this and the pulling back of the front foot, decrescimento, a, de, a decrescere. The um, this is lazily understood, I think, and I say lazy because I'm referring to my own understanding for a long time. This is lazily understood as a, to mean a decreasing step because it just makes geometrical sense, right? He's talking about passing forwards, passing back, increasing forwards, increasing back. Doesn't that all nice and tie up like a, a with a nice bow? What it's more likely that he's referring to here in decrescere, and he's referring to a specific action that he again refers to way in Jaco Largo. We have to go to, to Largo to see it, but we're going to go there for the sake of, of uh, our, our study here. This is against a leg attack. And he is just very, very quickly glossing over the play. The instruction of the scholar is the scholar is to pass backwards, uh, um, uh, um, is either to pass backwards or to decrescere their their lead leg okay depends on how you understand it but the word he uses when the opponent attacks your leg withdraw the foot you have forward or pass back okay and the word he uses withdraw the foot is decreasing discressing so what that may mean discressing discressing what that may mean is that Fiore is actually not referring here to an increase, an increasing step and a decreasing step. He's saying there's four more concepts in this art, passing forward, passing back, increasing forward, and gathering back. So a gathering step is a piece of footwork that we um, refer to when the lead foot is drawn back to meet the trailing foot to take a place beside the trailing foot, at least temporarily, right? Um, so this is, an, this is referred to as a gathering step, okay? A passing step would be if the foot actually continued back, landed on the ground, so the player was in a neutral position again, right? But a gathering step is when the foot comes back to the back foot 
um, for a specific reason, right? Now, I'm not going to get into the, the utility of gathering steps here. I want to get more bogged down, but but that's kind of what Fiori is talking about here, okay? So what does that mean? What do we care? This last sentence here, we're going to read this as there are four more constants in this art. Uh, a mezzovolta going forwards or backwards, an increasing step, and a gather step, uh, a gathering step back. Okay? And that's the whole paragraph. <laughs> very, very dense paragraph. Does anybody have any questions about what we talked about? No? Okay. Great. So to wrap that paragraph up, um, one more time, uh, we begin the sword in two hands section with a uh, broad discussion of theory, but a specific discussion of footwork. And it's the only one we're really going to get, at least in this form. There is going to be some mention of footwork later, but um, it's not significant. It's not that significant. Um, so this is really important for us, and not least because we, we know independently that um, footwork is critical for, um, for good fencing. So um, 22 R, A and B, really important, uh, really important uh, part. Starting off the section with a bang. But now let's move on to the, um, to the guards. Folio 22 R, C. Um, who is next? Um, Andrew, would you like to read this one? Okay. We are six guards, each dissimilar from each other. I am the first to explain my nature. I am set to throw my sword, and the guards coming after me will also present their aptitudes. All right. So, <clears throat> so this is a bit of an this sounds like a bit of an introductory sentence to me. We are six guards, each dissimilar of each other. So let's take a look. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So he seems to be, t he wants to talk about these guards with the same breath in a unit. And he just said, in the previous section that alike guards are contrary to one another what one guard can do um the other alike guard can do you know he told us some stuff about guards and now he's saying first we're going to look at six guards and each is dissimilar from the other and beginning with the first he is going to explain his nature and you know as is obvious i i hope Fiori is talking about the guards by anthropomorphizing them, by making the guard into a, a, a human being. So the, the guards are going to talk about themselves. And this is something that Fiori's done throughout the book. He's anthropomorphized theoretical concepts. So this guard is going to talk about itself like a, like a human being would, right? Talk about its nature. And, um, and all the guards are going to end up doing that to some degree or another, okay? So, what does he say? I'm the first to explain my nature. I am set to throw my sword. And the guards coming after me will also present their aptitudes. So, what do we learn? What do we take away? Posta Sagittaria, here. This guard is apt to throw the sword. Cool. You can throw swords. We've seen him talk about opponents throwing swords before. When he mentioned that you could face a sword that's thrown, he didn't exactly say that that was a good thing. Like, there was nowhere before that Fury said, yeah, yeah, you could attack him with your sword. You know, you, you, could, you could cut him, you could thrust him. You could also throw your sword, too. It hasn't been obvious to us before that throwing your sword has been a thing, right? Cutting and thrusting, yeah, sure, that's kind of intuitive. But is throwing a sword a thing? Well, here's Fury saying, here's a post -it. Right? Here's a posta, and it's good to throw swords with. Cool. Very neat. Sorry, like, how, like, mm -hmm. why would you actually, like, how would you, th like, because why is this a good poster to throw a sword from? Because, like, I'm looking at it, and I don't see it at all. Well, um, that's a great question. Um, and we're going to get the high-res image on the screen. 
There we go. So why is this a good um, poster to throw the sword in? <clears throat> well, um, as someone who is by far not an expert at throwing swords, um, I have tested this post out quite a lot, and it's super fun. And so how this is going to work is you're going to throw the sword forward somewhat underhand, right? You're not going to throw it overhand, right? You're going to kind of throw it underhand. You're going to kind of um, toss it uh, violently with a shift of your weight and the extension of your arms while your hand is gripping the hilt in a particular uh, in a particular manner. And depending on who you ask, this person, you might have a thumb over the, a finger over the hilt here, right? If pictures matter, right? If small details do exist, then it is curious that this index finger is extended over the, the hilt here of this sword, where the other fingers seem to be below the, uh, the cross guard. So Fiora is saying, hey, here, this is a position that's, it's great to throw a sword in, and here's a grip that you can take. Through testing, we've also learned that putting a spin on the sword is conducive to accuracy. And it's possible that one of the reasons for this finger, this finger might be have might have been drawn here on purpose, is to allow you to spin the sword while you're th extending it and throwing it forward. So if that's if that's all true, this is actually a really friggin neat thing, right? Fury is showing us not only that you can throw a sword, but where to where to start, and also maybe a really cool technique about how to how to get an accurate pinpoint throw. And the spinning would happen like along the length of the sword. Yes, along the um, um oh my god my uh, uh along the um the y axis. Well, like along the, along the blade, along the long, along long of it. This yeah, uh, uh so yeah the spinning is the, the spinning is going to be. Uh, is going to be uh, from around the around the y-axis here. Uh, the, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be around around this axis. So the points the points going to be forward. The sword is going to be the cross is going to be spinning around, right? And the sword's going to be moving forward. Um, you know, where the point is where the point is facing. So I guess I could snip this too. What am I doing? What am I doing? Um, so if we do 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 do. So okay, here we go. <laughs> So the sword would be th would be thrown this way, point forward, right? And there's going to be a um, there's going to be a rotation here from the 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 turn of the finger, and the whole thing is going to go right forward, okay? And used by both hands. That's wild. Um, it, this is uh, this is actually a super. Not only is this a, is this an awesome activity, but it's also COVID safe. Um, go to your nearest fence and start whipping your sword at it. Not even joking. Like that's super fun. People might call the cops on you and stuff, but once they call the cops on you the first time, then the cops won't come again because you're just you're just practicing throwing your sword. What's wrong with that, right? So take it from me. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is how you throw your sword. We used to practice this all the time against um, chain link fences, right? You can even if you want to get fancy, you can even um, masking tape out different chain links on a fence to use as targets see if you can get the point of your sword um in them and take it from me this is uh you know we can always speculate to the nth degree about what times is good to do what but i've seen people in tournaments get you know hit with a thrown sword and it usually surprises the shit out of them it is something that is in the repertoire and it's especially great to do if your opponent doesn't know it. <laughs> so, totally valid and legit thing. Very cool. And this is the oops, excuse me. And this is the first of the dissimilar posters. Any further questions on that, uh, Alex or anybody? Nope. Uh, right. BD here. Yep, BD. BD, please. Uh, just a. Interesting to compare this to the image that we see later in the armored section and the right hand placement. Yes, um, I suppose we should um, bring that up too. So the um, where are we here? Okay. 
So as well as the general note that we saw a glimpse of an armored play in the sword in one hand, and now we're seeing a glimpse of it here in the sword in two hands. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Well, actually, this is a good opportunity. Thank you for um, poking me, BD. This is a good opportunity to compare the posters of the um, armored section to the six dissimilar posters that um, we're looking at right now. I was going to kind of build up to it and do it at the end as a kind of a thing, but you ruined it, BD. So we might as well we might as well do it right now. <laughs> You're welcome. It's, pro it's probably better we do it right now. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so um, <laughs> so here's post the Sagittaria from the the armor posters here. Okay. So interesting, Alex, to note is that his hand his handedness on the hilt is different in the armored section. What does that mean? Great discussion. Right, but um, this is post Sagittaria Folio 33 R A, and here we're looking at what I have called. It's not said in the text, but I have called post Sagittaria um, in my in this uh, this wiki. Um, this is a similar posta, which looks almost identical to post Sagittaria in the armored section, but here it is in the sword two hand section Folio 22 R C. Okay. Also, let's note, we won't spend too much time looking at this, but let's note, here are the different posters in the armored section. Um, the Guard of the Serpent, the Short Serpent, True Cross, High Serpent, excuse me, High Serpent, Middle Iron Gate, Post of Sagittaria, and uh, Bastard Cross. Okay? Short Serpent, True Cross, High Serpent, Middle Iron Gate, Post of Sagittaria and Bastard Cross. Okay, compared to the dissimilar posters, these excuse me, these six we're looking at, we have Post of Sagittaria, we have Left Tail, which we've already we already know. We have Short Serpent, so that's that's two two out of six. We got Bastard Cross, Post of Lidana, and some weird ass monster. <laughs> we're going to talk about. Okay, so three. This is my naming convention. Post um, uh, three out of these six posters are right from the armored section. It has a Sagittaria, Short Serpent, and Bastard Cross. Okay. Uh, Sagittaria, Short Serpent, Bastard Cross. Everybody see that? So isn't that cool? We're definitely going to return to these later. And of course, the commentary that's said here is going to be also matter to us later. So um, really neat. Thanks for putting that out, PD. I'd also argue that True Cross is very similar to Left Tail, just with the left hand on. Yes. And High Serpent and Finestra. Yes. Um, uh, there are there are definitely some striking similarities for our for our purposes. Um, well, um, it, it no. Uh, you're right, thousand percent. That they're very similar. Post a, a Kotalunga here doesn't have the second hand on the sword, but um, a cursory glance at this will show that they're very similar. And that's the next posta. So let's um, let's move on to it. Uh, where am I here? I don't want to get lost. There we go. Twenty-two RD. Okay, I think you're up next, BD. So uh, take it away. Armor guard useful both in and out of armor against a lance or a sword that is thrown at me. I can beat them away and make them miss me, which is why I'm confident they won't hurt me. Okay, so this is this guy's an arrogant asshole. Um, but we but we've seen them before. <laughs> and um, it's this card's really neat. Uh, uh, because he doesn't explicitly talk about the guards in the sword in one hand section he doesn't really name it right but he here here he is right here's this guard and we finally get a abstract discussion not a long one true and it actually doesn't tell us anything we don't already know but we finally get an abstract treatment of this guard in the sword in, in two hands section 
right? And uh, so, so what does he actually say about it? I am useful both in and out of armor. We already knew that. Against the lance or the sword that is thrown at me. We already knew that from the commentary before. But now we know it again. We're, we're, we're reminded. And um, spoilers, we're also going to see this in the mounted section. I may have mentioned that before, but we're going to see it again. I can... Um, uh, so it's good against uh, lances or swords that are thrown at him. Thrown at him? Hmm. Didn't we just do a guard that was um, that was throwing stuff? Right? We did post the Sagittaria. And curiously, post the Sagittaria 22RC, this is on the bottom left side of the page, 22RD, Coda Lunga, is on the right side of the page. So ba based on the text, it certainly seems like these two guards are set opposed to each other in the book, which is pretty neat. It's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, I won't pull the full page up. I'd have to dig it out from the, the, the museum site. But uh, these two guards here are opposed to each other. So this, this guy is talking about what he's good at what he can do he's talking about what we already know he can do from the sword in one hand section but he's also staring down his enemy who is opposite the page of him it's good both in and out of armor against the lance or sword that is thrown at me i can beat them away and make them miss me which is why i'm confident they won't hurt me so if we if we needed any more evidence to know that this guard here is the same one that uh, we saw in the sword in one hand section, the last bit of evidence for that is the confidence, the explicit again Fiori's explicit effort to express confidence in this guard. So isn't that cool, right? Left tail we get it we get a treatment. Next, moving to the top of the next folio, 22VA. Can we have uh, Bruce? I am a guard set to deliver a long thrust. The increased reach of this thrust is equal to the length of my sword's handle. I am quite useful when my opponent and I are both in armor. Since I'm only presenting a short length of my point, I cannot be deceived. Okay, so there's actually a lot second, in here. Second edition. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Bruce. So, Short Serpent, um, Folio 22VA. Um, should we compare to the Sword and Armor section? Nah, 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 that's only too bogged down. All right. So, what does he say? I am a guard set to deliver a long thrust. And the way I hold the sword makes it possible to extend the thrust considerably. Actually, we're going to compare because it's necessary to the point I'm going to make. So this is um, Short Serpent, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what is, um, what's the commentary? What's the commentary for Short Serpent? Let's, um, let's read this. I'll, I'll read it. So in the armored section, he says... I am the, sh the short serpent, and I consider myself better than the others. If I can... Ah, no, the code! If I give you a thrust, you'll surely bear the mark. All right. So he doesn't really say much about short serpent, but he does mention thrusting. So um, at least we, we kind of know we're in the same... We're in the same theme here, right? We're... We're in the same theme here with uh, with with these two posts, but this guy's out of armor. So what does he say more about thrusts? What does he say that the armored post it doesn't? He says it's possible to deliver a long thrust, and the way I hold the sword makes it possible to extend the thrust cons considerably. So the long thrust he's talking about is a thrust where. Um, is a thrust where you take your well, your 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 um, left hand is already off the sword, right? 
Your left hand's already off the sword, but when you do this thrust, this hand's going to leave the sword entirely. And this hand is going to is going to propel that sword forward with a huge extension of your foot, probably with a with a your lead leg as your right uh, with your right foot as your lead leg. But it's a really long extended thrust. Okay? With one hand and that hand gripping the pommel. Which is actually pretty crazy because this is one of the very, very few times with the sword in two hands play that we actually see the right hand leaving its natural position right under the cross guard. I can only think of I can only think of two: this posta and the thrust that might follow, and a, a disarm, where the right hand leaves its natural place uh, near the the top of the cross guard. So very very curious, um, but uh, but also a bit of a niche play, right? This is a long thrust that Fior is talking about. He says it's great in armor. Okay, so he goes out of his way to say it's great in armor. He doesn't say it's not good out of armor, but he doesn't really go on about it either. Um, and he says, since I'm presenting the, the, short, um, the short length of my point, I can't be deceived. What this probably means is that unlike an extended point forward guard, it's very difficult to engage this sword right it's very difficult to engage the sword even by 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 um, even if your opponent um, you know thrusts at you and brings their sword out to a point forward guard as well this this guard is more held back than you might think and the reason why this is a good thing for the technique that Fiore is describing is that you know a long thrust is a large action and if your opponent's in contact with your sword before you start that action, <laughs> if they get thrust with that, then they deserve it. And they ought to die in shame. Because they're going to have an, a veritable eternity of time in your extension and action. If they're engaged with your sword. right? If they're not engaged with your sword, then a long thrust can really surprise someone who has thought they have accurately assessed the distance between the two figures right they thought they were safe they thought they were you know the person would have to put their foot in to hit me they thought that you know whatever and all of a sudden this massive long thrust comes out of nowhere and uh and even in in armor right in armor your um uh, uh your uh, your ability to visually judge your surroundings is significantly reduced in armor you could find yourself caught at a bad distance and have this thundered into your weak points armpit you know uh, uh, up your aventail or whatever inner thigh you could find it thundering in with uh, um, in, in in any moment so this is a really open neat... visor yeah open visor exactly right exactly now, what are the downsides, right? Well, the obvious downsides of a play like this is that if you take your hand off this part of the sword, if it's defended, you're in big trouble. Big, big trouble, right? The natural flow of sword play, where your sword is at this normal part of the, of the, the handle, right below the cross guard, if your sword gets beat or deflected or whatever it's not the end of the world you can potentially compensate right but here it's very risky it's very difficult to compensate effectively if this attack is successfully defended or much less defended well so this action is it has a place in the art like a lot of things fury is showing us but it has some significant inherent risks in it Though it ought to be stressed that this action that Fiore is suggesting 
is not inherent or it's not fundamental to the posta. This isn't the only thing you can do from here. Fiore is saying, this is on um, the short serpent, and one thing you can do is this long extended thrust. Okay, and I think that's how we should we should read it. Right? Same with posta sagittaria. Um, this has a lot of other uses than throwing the sword. It's actually used in armor quite ext extensively, but it can be used to throw the sword, right? So don't don't read these suggestions as uh, as a, sort of the, the 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 universal usage for this this poster. Okay. Um, all right. Enough said about that. Let's move on. Bastard cross. Bastard cross. Uh, Connor, would you like to uh, read for us? Oh, Connor maybe is having audio issues. And he's he's muted himself. Okay, let's move down the list. Daniel, would you like to uh, read for us? Please. Against sword, axe, and dagger, you know. I hold my sword at mid blade with my left hand so that I can fend off the dagger, which can do me more harm than other weapons. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Bastard cross. Okay. <clears throat> so, as we know from the armored section, Bastard cross, and what we're going to see from the armored section is Bastard cross is an awesome poster. It can do a whole ton of shit. It's one of the most versatile posters of the um, the sword in, in, in two hands, or of the um, uh, sword and armor, which is, uh, the sword and armor is used mostly uh, with a hand on the blade. Um, it's a very versatile poster. It's fantastic. It's great. Lots of things you can do. Of all those things that you could do, what does Fiore mention? Well, he mentions that it's this is a good guard against a sword and an axe, first mention, I think so far of, oh no, it's not the first mention, second or third mention of axe, but okay, against a sword, against the axe, and against the dagger in armor. I'm a good guard against sword, axe, and dagger in armor. There's that armor again, even though he's not drawn in armor. I hold my sword in the, uh, in the middle by the middle with my left hand to fend off a dagger which can do to me what the other weapons can do and worse so this ought i would i would hope to call to our minds um something we've already seen which is the sword and dagger plays so in these two, um, well, in all of these plays here, in all of these plays here, the second master and the scholar and these two plays under here, um, maybe not this one, maybe not this one, but the point is these plays are very similar, very similar to use to using the sword and bastard cross. Or in or in true cross, true cross and bastard cross are kind of their their uh, brothers, right? They're um, the only difference between them is the uh, whether the the thumb is pointing towards the point or the thumb is pointing towards the hilt. That's the only the, the only difference between them. Um, uh, but uh, when we looked at the sword and dagger section. We saw a situation where we had both hands on the hilt and we were grasping the sword. You know, maybe it was near the cross guard, maybe it was a little bit in the middle, but uh, we were using um, something like true ambassador cross to do the things we needed to do against, this, uh, against the dagger. And um, what Fury is talking about here is he's trying, I think, to call up our knowledge of this and say, all right, look, we've already seen how a sword can respond to a dagger, though granted we've seen it with a hilt, uh, with a hilt, with a, with a scabbard on the sword. We could also deal with the dagger in a similar way with this posta, okay, with, um, with this posta here, which is bastard cross, okay? 
So very neat stuff. Um, and again, as, uh, if I haven't mentioned already, my reading as to what these figures drawn out of armor mean when Fury is constantly referring to armor is just like with the dagger section. If he's referring to armor, but the figures drawn out of armor, then he seems to be making a statement that this is something that you can do for both. Right? If he only meant it in armor, he probably would show the figure armor. Right? It's an assumption, but I think it's a reasonable one. Okay. Um, next post. I think it's the last, the last of the, oh no, it's the second last of the cards. Okay. I'm sorry. Aaron, I still have yes. to ask, like, aren't you like at risk of like cutting yourself when you're, when you're holding the sword like that? It, it, like with a dagger, like I understood it because you were mentioning how the, the design of the dagger like allowed for that much mm -hmm. more than with a sword, but like a sword inherently implies like, you know, edges. Uh, and like the way he's holding it, like, isn't he like cutting his fingers as that is happening, or cutting his gloves, or right? Um, like, so that, I have that, a hard time around it. Sure. So that's a great question. Okay, that's an excellent question. And it's gonna it's going to um, revolve around it's it's gonna involve heavily our understanding of this usage of the sword in two hands. Because let's remember, um, in the armored section, this sword is being used, being grasped by the by the blade. But uh, these guys don't have, like, you know, mail in their palms. Not likely, right? These guys are using um, steel gauntlets that have some kind of leather on the gauntlet, right? So, so what's the deal with grabbing blades? What's the deal with grabbing blades? Well, thankfully, this isn't the first time we've seen a bla uh, blade grab. Okay. So the first time we saw a blade grab was um, in the sword in one hand section. I think that's true. Yeah. We saw a blade. Um, oh, no, no. I lied to you. I totally lied to you. Have we not seen a blade grab yet? <gasps> yeah, saying... in the dagger section. In the dagger section. We saw a blade grab against the sword. I don't think so. Not against the sword, no, but we've seen them grab the blade and daggers oh, have edges. That's true. That's true. Um, and um, and that is that is going to bolster our point, uh, or the point I'm going to make. But um, let's so let's skip ahead to the plays. I'm actually shocked that we haven't seen a sword grab yet. All right. So that's even a, that's that's an even better question, since we haven't even seen a formal sword grab yet. So um, let's let's take that question seriously. In the Largo section, there we go. There we go. And the Largo section that we're going to see in upcoming weeks, we're going to see two plays specifically that involve grabbing the sword with your hand. Okay. So grabbing a sword is grabbing a sword, right? So grabbing a sword in these plays is the same kind of grabbing a sword as it is here or it is here. So what's the deal with grabbing swords, right? Excellent question. So the deal is this, that um, often swords were only razor sharp in their last third. Okay. Secondly, even if the swords were significantly sharp, all the way down to the you know, the, the the cross guard, the swords. Um, uh, the swords aren't sharp to the degree that, say, you know, um, not to be facetious, but like to say that like a lightsaber is sharp. Like the swords aren't sharp enough such that if you just grabbed it, you would um, cut yourself. And, you know, uh, I don't know if you'd want to do this experiment, but um, even sharp knives in your house, they're probably not so sharp. These are the knives that you use to cook with they're probably not so sharp that if you just grab the the blade yourself grab you wrap your fingers all around it that you would cut yourself right now obviously there's a certain amount of pressure putting on that edge that may break this uh, this the bare skin if you have your hand but the principal way that swords cut is with is with the blade moving in the opposite direction of the thing being cut 
right? So, or especially if the thing being cut is being held still, right? If it's fixed in time and place, right? The way that you cut things on a cutting board, if you're cooking, is you fix the thing in time and place, and the knife moves around the thing. And in that way, the knife will will um, will, will cut the object that you want you're wanting to cut. Swords work in the same way. So the first thing to note here is that even if the sword is sharp, and you had your bare hand on it, the sword is unlikely to cut your hand in any way, as long as your hand and your sword move as one, move together, and as long as your hand on the blade doesn't move down or up the blade. Okay? And that's even if you had your bare hand on it. Even better is if you had a glove on it. If you had a leather gloved hand, not only does it, would that allow you to put significant pressure on the blade in a way that might be a little dodgy with your, the, your bare hand, but a gloved hand could grip the blade confidently, securely, and without the nagging you know, a worry about some sort of incidental little slip. Right? And we're talking sharp swords here. We're talking sharp swords. So the long and the short of, of the story is that sharp swords can be easily and effectively grabbed not only by gloved hands, but also by bare hands. And the proof of that is not only that we can fight with the sword effectively in two hands, as we've seen, we're going to see in the armored section, but that we have plays where we grab the, the sword in the Largo section. We're going to see plays where we do that. And remember when we when we talked about the uh, the sword in one hand section, ta and looking at these plays for a bit, one of the reasons why the sword in one hand has the nature that it does, specifically that the sword in one hand needs to keep moving. It needs to be agile. One of the reasons for this is because blade grabs are deadly against a sword in one hand. Blade grabs ruin everything. And if your sword gets bound up in the center and stops moving for an instant, and if your opponent can chameleon-like get his hand on that blade, even if it's just putting one section of his fingers over on the other side of the sword. You're in super, super deep shit. Blade grabs are awesome, amazing, and you should grab all the swords that you ever can. Right now, obviously, there's a trick to doing it. You can't grab swords that are moving. That's very classic. There's been a lot of um, hilarious and unfortunate Emma injuries and bruises because of practicing blade grabs and, of course, failing constantly. And I definitely have my fair share of those in my time. And I'm going to have very many more <laughs> in the future once COVID, uh, because, you know, because of COVID. But um, blade grabs are fantastic. So the long and the short of it is that blades, uh, so not only can swords be grabbed, grab them, grab them, grab them, grab them. They're great. If you, if you have an opportunity to grab the sword, you should do it. You shouldn't be afraid of cutting your hand, especially if you have uh, uh, Shemwise gloves, as Fury says in his... Um, is in his introductions and last but not least um, or perhaps least but this is definitely also a, an important point if you could get a significant advantage and maybe end the fight with a blade grab maybe you might take a cut to the hand but it very well might be worth it right that thing that sort of thing very well might be worth it so um, the, the, the worry of cutting your hand by putting it on the sword ought to be uh, driven from the minds of all of, all of, our, uh, of us students here. Don't even worry about it. It's not a thing. Um, don't take our word for it. Um, you know, there's lots of examples of this. It's actually, YouTube is actually, uh, oddly enough, not bad for examples of, of, of this. Um, so if you're really skeptical, you can go and find some crazy, uh, crazy people doing this, uh, like, you know, rubbing their hands on sharp swords and whatnot. 
but yeah, it's totally a thing. Totally a thing. And p particularly with unarmored sword in uh, in two hands, using the sword like we see in armor is also a thing, right? It's a perfectly legitimate and acceptable way to use it, the weapon that we're fighting with if the situation merits it, okay? And we already got a glimpse of that at the end of the sword in one hand section when we saw the first time a sword used in both hands when the blade is grabbed, okay? We already saw this. So does that answer your question, uh, Alex? Yeah, basically, like, don't worry about grabbing swords. Not even a little bit. No. All right. The only thing you should worry about with sword grabs is fucking it up because that gets your hand hit when the sword is moving. And that shit sucks. I have had many, many weeks cursing my own ineptitude while nursing my hand and having coworkers ask me, what's wrong with you? What was, what was wrong with your hand? I'm like, oh, I tried to grab a moving sword again. <laughs> Oh, memories. All right. So, so that's again, to summarize, hmm? don't worry about grabbing stationary swords, whether they're yours or your opponent's. Yes, that's right. That's right. That was said so well, I wish I would have said it. All right, let's finish. Uh, let's finish these six up here. Folio 22VC. Uh, Graham, would you like to read this one? Sure thing. Um, I am called Guard or Posta Didana. I am separate from the other ways of holding the sword, which are all different, although the guard coming after me seems similar to me, save for the fact that the sword has virtually become an axe. Wow, all right, so what's going on here? I am Posta Didana. Okay, we saw this already, right? We saw this already in uh, 22 RAB. So, and here he is again, basically identical to this figure. He's unrefused, right? In post Ladonna. Okay. I am called post Ladonna. I am separate from the other ways of holding the sword, which are all different. Okay. This we also knew. So far, uncontroversial. Although, he says, the guard coming after me seems similar to me. Save for the fact that the sword has virtually become an axe. What the fuck? Okay. Um, okay, so this is posted to Didana. It is separate from the other ways of holding the sword. We knew that already. And a bunch of stuff about the next play. <laughs> this, you know, posted to Didana here it seems similar to the one coming after me, but it's, you know, there's something different about it. The next play has something different about it. So, okay, all right. He doesn't really say much. It's not a lot to not a lot a lot to squeeze from this uh from this text here. But he shows us Posta Longa again. Uh, uh excuse me, Posta Didona again. And maybe it's good that he did just if for no other reason to remind us that these posts here are not included in the six. Right? Um the uh I was gonna make a I was gonna make a Toronto joke, but it sounded lame in my head, so I pulled out. <laughs> Not included in the these six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so these these posts of Didon aren't included, but sure enough, he pops it in right at the end. And uh, and isn't that cool? Alright. So, last but not least, what is this excuse me, what is this poster that looks like an axe but is similar to Posta Didona? Um what the hell is going on here? Alright. 22VD. Oh, look at that. Last posta for Amber. Amber, would you like to read this one for us? This sword is both a sword and an axe. Weighty things can be of great impediment to those that are light. This is also a posta didana, the noble high guard, who often uses her deceptions to trick the other guards. You think I'm attacking you with a cut, when I'm instead thrusting, all I have to do is lift my arms over my head and I can deliver a good, quick thrust. All right. So what the hell's going on here? <laughs> this this post has thrown me for loops for years. It's a really curious one. 
um, but I'm going to try and give some uh, some uh, forced clarity to it. Um, I'll, I'll give you one view. So first of all, he seems to make some comments about Posta di Nona, which probably were better put in the other Posta, right? But uh, nonetheless, let's go. What does he say? This sword is both a sword and an axe. What the hell does that mean? There's a sword. And, okay, in the armored section, um, in the armored section, there's, no, that's the sword section. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> in the armored section, there's an axe. There's a pole axe. So what does he mean there's a sword and there's an axe? Right, this sword has become an axe. So one thing he might mean is tied to this statement. Weighty things can be a great impediment to those that are light. Well, thanks, genius. Please say more. What is what? What do you mean? Well, sneakily, there are two swords that are that are snuck into later in the manuscript, and those swords are probably, my view anyway, what Fiore means when he talks about this sword. It's probably what he's trying to show. Now, interestingly, about this cross guard thing here, okay. What I believe this is, I don't know that the actual word for it, but this is actually a sliding cross guard. It slides down the blade. And it's for a kind of sword that is extremely heavy and weighty and often used in armored combat. Possibly armored combat in the lists. Okay. But in the um, but let's take a look at what these swords are. So in the sword and armor section, we actually have two swords. Two swords given to us. One with a nasty, disgusting pommel, and another one without, with a little notch in the middle. And there's some significant text to it. So what the hell does he say? First, this is folio 35RC. Number one, this sword is equally a sword and an axe. Aha! Awesome. <laughs> we were wondering what the fuck this was. It's a sword and an axe. Well, okay, and he doesn't really go on to talk about it after this, so we're left to speculate until later in the book. But boom, here we go. This sword is equally a sword and an axe. Okay, so we're probably talking about this thing. It should not have a sharp edge from the guard to about six inches from the point. Well, actually, if we look here, this point has a bit of a notch in it. Okay. So the pommel, note the pommel, note this thingy, and Aaron, note, note the notch. Yes, Bruce. I'm not seeing anything. I'm still... Is anybody else not seeing anything? Oh, did my stream pop, uh, stop or something? It's uh, still going for me. I'm I still seeing see it. it. Yep. Yeah, I'm good. Maybe try leaving and coming back on the stream, uh, Bruce. Maybe there's some lag or something. I think that's called a rondel. Uh, the um, uh, this thing here. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, uh, very well may be. Very well may be. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's read the read the text. This is this sword is equally a sword and an axe. It should not have a very sharp edge from the guard to about six inches from the point. Its point should be sharp, and its sharp edge should be about six inches in length. Okay, so he's talking about the uh, the notched bit at the end of the blade here. The small rondelle under the hilt, there you go, should be able to glide to about six inches from the point, but not beyond that. The hilt should be well-tempered and sharp, and the pommel nice and heavy, with its points well-tempered and absolutely sharp. Wow, he's very explicit with that. The front of the sword should be as heavy as the back. And the weight should be between four and six pounds. That's a heavy friggin' sword. And the man carrying the sword will wear armor proportional to its size and its length. Awesome. That's that's really cool. So that's probably what we're refer what we're what we're talking about with this guy. Sorry, Aaron. Can you get back to the image? Uh, yes, what I can. exactly on that image glides? Great question. So the the gliding part here, 
in this image is this thing. So in this image, this little rondelle here has is glided all you know it's it's shifted all the way to near the hilt. But in this image, uh, excuse me, in this image, the rondelle is all the way at the top, of, near the near the point. So this is the same the same rondelle that we're talking about. So uh huh. Does that make and sense? What function, what function does it serve? Is it like a secondary uh, cross guard for the second part of the sword? Yes, Wait. if you're if you're using the sword, um, if you're if you're using the blade of the sword, uh, uh, one hand on the blade, one hand on the hilt, right? This is a sword that can be used very effectively, um, like um, uh, um, it can be used very effectively and is conducive to use, like what we often see in the sword and armor plays. Uh, often the sword and armor plays, and what characterizes this section, as we will um, find out. The use of the sword in uh, with one hand on the hilt and one hand on the blade, using the sword in, in both hands like that to shift the point forward to stab weak points or to shift the pommel to the side and smash and concuss the enemy. So this is something that you can do. You can do with a regular long sword, but these swords here do it better. They're great. And the fact that the blade isn't sharp, except six inches from the hilt, is in no way an impediment to its use or its deadliness. And I don't know about you, but this th this thing seems a lot more deadly than than this thing to me, than the, uh, you know, uh, the, the regular, the regular uh, uh, longsword. This thing is a friggin' beast. It's uh, you versus the guy she tells you not to worry about. Yeah. This thing's a beast. Um, now, what about the other one? Let's read the other one, the second sword. This other sword should have a full edge, save for an unsharpened section at a th the third below the point, where a gloved hand can comfortably grasp it. Its edge and point must be very fine. The hilt sharp, strong, well-tempered, and the pommel weighty and pointed. So here's another example of a sword that can be used in two hands uh, with where the hand is on the blade. It's a different style of sword. It's still got a pointed pommel, but it's not as um, as uh, Excalibur-esque as this sword. Um, but, but, they, but there you go. So I don't want to say too much more about this stuff now, not least because I don't really know that much more than what I've said about where these swords are in the sort of the the, the contemporary corpus of armor fighting in, uh, with Fury. But um, all that is to say is that it's my view that this is what he's talking about with this, with this play. And he's showing the use of this sword in the sword and two hands section. And particularly, let's remember that he's grasping the end of the blade here. And he and as if he would do a fendente attack with the hilt of the sword. This is colloquially called a murder stroke. Um, I think that um, a colloquialization comes from the German manuscripts. But why the hell is he doing this sort of thing? Well, he gives us a clue. Weighty things can be of great impediment to those that are light. So if someone, say, I don't know, has a dagger, it's going to be a lot harder for them to stop this fendente. It's going to come hurtling down like a thunderbolt than it would be maybe to stop even to stop the blade if you tried to do some sort of deft attack, right? Or if someone had a thin or a light weapon using the sword like this, totally legit, totally possible, and it might be of great effect, to great effect. He, last things he says about this, he makes some comments about Posta di Donna. It is the high noble guard, and she uses, uh, he feminizes it now, but he, she uses her malices to deceive the other guards. You think I'm attacking with a cut, but instead I'm thrusting. 
and all I have to do is lift my arms over my head and I can deliver a good quick thrust. So we'll talk more about this um, next week when we dive into the posters. A whole bunch of things can be done through posted transitions. And there are lots of posters of the sword, but transitioning between them is not a big deal. Once you've trained it a lot, and this is why, this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, <laughs> Emma students have to <laughs> do posted transitions forever and ever until their brain melts out of their the side of their head. <laughs> um, it's because posted transitions are really the bread and butter of um, uh, of, uh, of excellent fencing outside of footwork. And through posta transitions, you can go from a posta that isn't necessarily conducive to what you want to do to the one that is in the blink of an eye. And so posta di donna is great. Uh, you can transition from posta di donna very easily. It's a high guard. It can go low very quick. It can do what you need to do. And we'll talk more about that when we uh, look at the postas next week. Okay. And that's it for the six postas or the six guards. Next, we're going to deal with the 12, the 12 posts with the, with the red text. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about anything that we've talked about today? Sorry. So again, the, the post Donna and the post Donna with like the axle grip, they're mm -hmm. kind of just two separate ones, right? They are. Okay. They are. Yeah. Are they really? Nah, I don't think so. All right. But you know. You could do you could do this with this sword, right? It's not a, a not a problem. But it's all posted a de donor. There's a there's a whole bunch of different posted de donors that are more or less the same. There's some various positions of refusal, or or twist. But we're going to find out there's more. Okay. Um, all right. Before we go, uh, who are the scholars left? Uh, B, uh, Andrew and BD. Um, Andrew, would you like to um, add or subtract anything to what I've said? Well, this is just a good introduction to the system, and it's something that uh, a lot of people overlook in their eagerness to jump into the plays and start doing them. You can gather a mm. lot of principles just from listening to the guards talk about their, what they do. Yeah, for sure. And every time I read these, I, I hate myself for not reading them more because I, 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 I ignore these very much. Right. I don't spend the time on them that I should. So this is fantastic for me, uh, uh, for me, too. It's good stuff. Uh, BD, would you like to add or subtract anything from what I've said tonight? Yes, of course. The last section mm -hmm. that we looked at reminds me of Peasant Strike. So what the agent is doing, mm -hmm. really winding up false point. And that ties into deception, which we'll see later. And I'd also like to mention that our uh, Emma Guelph Provost David Murphy admonishes our scholar, uh, us scholars all of the time to take close attention to the poster sections and to this mm -hmm. section, which we, we nickname Trash Talking the Guards, mm -hmm. as a, a way of looking at all of the different things that can be done. And you, yes. you can You can... You can defend, you can attack, you can thrust, you can thrust one-handed, you can throw the weapon, and you can do armored plays. Yeah, they, uh, it, it definitely is. It definitely is. Um, so you said the uh, false point and the, um, the shamanic peasant strike. and the peasant strike. So uh, this, these are two plays, guys, that we're going to see in probably two weeks from now, maybe three. The peasant strike is this play here folio 26 ra and it's it's an action against somebody who strikes down with a very very hard blow and the false point play is the last play in the largo section where um well, it's a neat, it's a neat little it's a neat little play i don't want to spoil it but uh, th th this is what bd's referring to the false point play is folio 27 va and 27 VB. And specifically looking at deception mm -hmm. in terms of projecting an intent and mm -hmm. that might not be your, your actual intent mm -hmm. or flexibility of changing your line mm -hmm. through poster transition as mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole, there's a whole lot in the posters. Um, 
there's a whole lot on the post list. One of the things that you that uh, I think was much more visible early in the Fiore project was when people sort of started to really read Fiore and they you know try to try to take them seriously, like okay, these posts, these these are the things, right? You used to get a lot of instances where um, people would uh, they'd be fencing, but they'd be doing something that sort of um, uh, irreverently called a stalking nowadays. And by stalking, I mean you have two people who are kind of circling each other, and they're playing the poster game. They're transitioning between different posters, um, trying to find a good poster match that favors them so that they can launch an attack, and, but not actually engaging. Um, uh, I don't want to speak too derogatorily about that, but all that is to say is that when you really start to take posters seriously and you try and really play this game, there is definitely that aspect to it. Choosing a good poster against your opponent is, is a, an important skill, and it's one that you don't really have time to do. So you need to ingrain it as a habit. You need to do it as subconsciously. Um, but it's something that's really important in fencing, and it can have um, significant consequences. Engaging, uh, trying to defend with a bad poster can you know, ruin your whole engagement for you. And but choosing the right posta can can make it. So yeah, there's no getting around it. Posts, posts, posts. All right. So uh, I think that's that's it. Uh, thank you guys very very much for coming. As always, next week we will move on to the twelve um, the twelve posts with the red text. We're going to see lots of plays. We're going to see some um, interesting theory discussions, and it's all going to build up anticipation for our entrance into Jaco Largo. So should be uh, great. Um, yeah, S stay safe, stay happy, um, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Good night. Yeah. Aaron. Good night. I did have one question. Yes, Have sir. you ever actually seen that, uh, that crazy, weird sword? Have they ever made it? It's a great question. I think I've seen it in a museum. I think I've seen an example okay. of it in a museum, but I can't recall where, to be honest. Because, yeah, that's, it's really very strange, especially the sliding rondelle. I'm just like, what? What is this? Yeah, I, I, oh, man, I see. I wish I knew more about it. I'm pretty sure the last time I investigated this, the answer I got was that the two swords that are shown there at least at least the, the the main one the big one with the spiky pommel that's a sword specifically for armored fighting at the lists oh that was yeah. that you were likely to find used by people who were armor fighting in the lists rather than say yeah. on, on a battlefield somewhere but i wouldn't i wouldn't uh, uh quote me on that i've seen yeah. the simpler one before yep yeah. oh, the yeah. one with the, with the notch yeah it's neat yeah I've seen the simpler one before in museums, the one with the unsharpened section in the middle of the blade and the pointed pommel. Um, yeah, yeah that is. Yeah, the sliding part, I was just like, that's isn't unique. That, yeah, isn't that, isn't that cool? I've always found that so so neat. Like some some of the smallest things in the manual are some of the coolest, uh, um, the coolest things. And uh, this is a real, real little, neat little footnote. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's annoying that he shoves it all the way at the back. Like, or it seems like, he, you know, he's referring to something and you're like, what the fuck is that? But then, you know, and then, and then you finally realize that, or, you know, you, you realize again that he's not talking to you. Like, that you're an idiot. He's talking to people who know, or he seems like he's talking to people who know what, who know what these things are. So he's, he's yeah. he, didn't, he didn't feel compelled to explain this shit before. He doesn't have to. You already know what it is. He's just giving it a treatment now later in the book. But at first, when you see that, you're like, huh? Yeah, I was looking through yeah. one forum, and they were saying that th they thought that this might have even been an invention of Fiore's, that, mm. you know, this crazy spiky pommel with a sliding rondelle was like him just being like, hey, if I were going to make a weapon, this is how I'd make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, we have, we've had, uh, we have Andrew's corroboration just on this call that he's seen an example of one of these. 
Yeah. So it's so it's unlikely that this is an invention of his. With respect to this one, I mean, maybe it's possible. Maybe he maybe he really preferred it at the time as a weapon in the list, where maybe others in his cohort didn't. You know, who knows, right? That's a really interesting uh, question. This is this just looks terrifying, though. It's it really does. Just just awful. Imagine being murder struck by this guy. Fuck that. Oh, like, do we, d d attack me with a poleaxe instead. <laughs> pommel strike. All I'm yeah. thinking of is pommel strike and going, oh, you're dead. You're so dead. Yeah, it's brutal. Although I just, I have to laugh. I, I can't, I can't not think of the movie Excalibur because of the oh. sword. I, I don't like that movie. Uh, I, 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 but it's, it's. It's so funny. Uh, this these spikes because all the armor has spikes in that in that bloody movie. And this <laughs> this sword and the one uh, um, uh, the one armor guy uh, who has spikes. High serpent. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. High serpent. It just <laughs> it's just, it's a figure right out of. If if only he was if only he was holding the spiky sword, you know. It's a figure like Ooh. right out of the movie Excalibur, and it's just too. Uh, it's just too funny. I just imagine um, imagine um, Patrick Stewart in, <laughs> in yes. armor yelling, Merlin! Merlin! <laughs>